ಆವಿರಾವೀರ್ಮಹೇಧಿ ವೇದಸ್ಯಮ ಆಣೀಸ್ಥ ಶ್ರುತ ಮೇ ಮಾಸಿ ಅನೇನಧೀತೇನಾಹೋರಾತ್ರನ್ ಸಂದಿ ಹೃತ ವದಿಷ್ಯಾಮಿ ಸತ್ಯ ವದಿಷ್ಯಾಮಿ ತನ್ಮಾಮವಥು ತದ್ವಕ್ತಾರಮವಥು ಅವಥು ಮಾಂ ಅವತು ವಕ್ತಾರ ಅವತು ವಕ್ತಾರ ಶಾಂತಿ 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 Okay, we are in the second hymn of the fifth book. Kumara Atreya. Is it still Agni? Yes. Yeah, the, the first 28 hymns of fifth book are Agni's hymns. Yeah, all of them. Usually each mandala starts with Agni hymns. Um, I don't know, maybe only uh, book nine starts with Soma hymns. otherwise all the books are starting with agni hymns and they are packed in one passage and then after that usually indra comes or vayu or indra uh, after indra there will be ashwins and then mitra varuna and everybody else it's the usual order i do not know why vyasa made it in that way uh, the first book is a bit different first mandala because there are um there are families of rishis yeah so you have uh, madhu chanda vaishwamitra for example first and then you will have kanva and then you will have kanva family rishis then you will suddenly have somebody else like parashara shaktya or dirghatama auchatya or gotama rahugana it's the whole family yeah? then agastya rishi agastya rishi would uh, be the last uh, family in this first uh, book yes yes lin okay permission to record for all of us yes sure sure oh, sorry um so here we have this um uh we have uh the uh, the atri family huh? the atri family is um, belonging to angiras family basically this is angirasa rishis and what is interesting about them and not all atris are in angirasas but they kind of go together as if they belong to one family a lineage and girasa rishis belong to the younger rishis to the nutana rishis and um, they are representing the new trend in their spirituality they discovered the divine within the heart now from that time on they discover the lord as brahaspati and brahaspati or brahman is within the heart the word is rising from the heart from the ocean heart that is the new divinity and uh, before there were all kind of um, uh, godheads they were nearly the same uh, for example all these adityas they belong to the ancient gods and to them uh, the offering was made by soma soma was offered and the soma yagas are the ancient rishis uh, rituals they belong to the bhargava rishis to the bhrigu family which by the means of offering the delight of their existence and experience to the growing power within were perfecting their nature uh this perfection of nature by the sacrifice offering to it um all your uh, delight of existence yeah to the quintessence which is growing within you 
was the, the way of the ancient sacrifice, Soma Yakas. But these Angirasa Rishis are different. Their ways are also Soma sacrifice, but in a different way. They are offering the delight into the flame of the heart, not into the flame in nature, as the ancient rishis did, but into the flame of the heart. They discovered that within the heart there is also agni, but of different kind, as it were. So this is very uh, significantly, throughout the hymns you can find these indications, telling us that the agni can be worshipped in two different ways, as yajatra or yajata by the sacrifice, or as a priya, or idia, as a beloved. Now, to be worshipped as a beloved is this new way, love in the heart for the divine. Hmm? Now we are dealing with this family. May I ask you a question? Yes. So is, is that new way more just like surrender? In the sacri instead of sacrifice, it's more like surrender to the divine, which is found in the heart. Surrender, Correct. giving, giving your all. Absolutely, uh, you're absolutely right. You got it. So, yeah? That is the way of surrender, rather than the way of doing and making things work, yeah? perfecting them in nature by doing correctly. And this is the ancient way. And you can see that the whole Western tradition went ancient way, kind of perfecting the body rather than making the surrender to the divine within you, finding that presence and surrendering. But it you. seems like in the same way that when, when Buddhism came up, um, where they no longer really needed the Brahmins, to do the sacrifice where it the whole culture changed to if you do this kind of massive internal surrender then it doesn't matter whether your pronunciation is right and it doesn't matter if you do this um, ceremony in the right order and it doesn't matter if you have the grass and all the paraphernalia there as much it, it matters only that you have this capacity to um, yeah. to engage with the divine on your own. Correct. Well, the, Is that right? the, yeah, yeah. Well, Buddhism was already against the ritualism, pure ritualism, which lost already the sense of the knowledge. Yeah? Uh, the ritualism oh. was um, already void of the spirit. It was uh, mechanical as we have it today. And of course, uh, even in Gita, Sri Krishna is against this ritualistic approach, which has no right. knowledge. So Buddhism was against this kind of religious attitude without the spirit. And they became more and more psychological as we find it in the Gita and also in Upanishads. They're looking for psychological experience rather than some approval of ritual, which has no meaning. Uh, so then what happened to the gods then? What so happened the, to the devas? Yeah, the devatas in the Upanishads become the faculties of consciousness. They lose their uh, names such as Indra, Ashvins and so on. They become... Uh, impersonal faculties of our consciousness. Uh, speech, hearing, seeing, uh, thinking, feeling, and being in the body. These are the first faculties, first six. Annam pranam chakshukshrotram manovacham. This is the definition of Upanishads, and these are the devatas. There are no other devatas, notice. So Upanishads are also like Buddhism, um, are very um, psychological. So this shift towards in the mental paradigm, in the mental structure of consciousness, the shift from a more mythical vision of the universal godheads towards more um, individual faculties of consciousness, we see in all religions. Buddhism is no exception. 
Buddhism, Jainism, uh, Hinduism, Upanishads, Gita, you can see a shift towards the mental structure of consciousness. Um, and then, of course, Puranas. Suddenly, Puranas, they bring this mythology in, uh, in the stories way. And, uh, and that is quite interesting. That's why they are called Puranas, ancient, because they do not fit into the mental structure <laughs> totally. Suddenly, they are interested in those devatas and gods as they are in, in their stories. But they do it with the means and tools of the mental consciousness, of the mental structure. And that looks very strange. Yeah? The same with Tantra. Tantra speaks about the truth of the Veda in the, in the Kali Yuga, in the way how mental structure can handle it. So it starts distinguishing different syllables, assigning them to different petals of different chakras. It's all that work of the mind, which is with its precision demands black and white knowledge. It doesn't want to have a broad experience. It wants a description which will be correct and precise. So we are drawn towards that uh, narrowing down the stream of wider cosmic vision of the Veda. Now in the Veda, the devatas are not individualized faculties. They are universal faculties of consciousness. And rishis uh, through their consciousness, individual, see them as universal. And that is the difference between the Upanishads and the Veda. Upanishads are already dealing with individual faculties. Mm. I was mentioning this that um, even I coined the t term for this. I said no, when we studied in the IPI, Indian Psychology Institute, for several years, every week we met to, to read the hymns that um, the, uh, the Vedas are the psychology of universals, not universals as universal powers or universal um, movements of consciousness, not individual. So here so we- when you, say, when you say universal like that, do you mean universal meaning common to all beings or common yes. to all beings? Or all beings, not only human beings, but also animal kingdom and uh, greenery, plants, minerals, to all beings applicable. This is the knowledge which um, deals with um, uh, universal movements of consciousness. That's why it is so grand and so vast and so easily appealing to any human being with whatever background. Whenever you read it, you are totally diving into it. Mm. Because it speaks about the truth in terms of universal achievement or realization. Okay, here, Kumara Atreya, yeah, he will be, uh, he dedicates the second hymn. It's a unique hymn, very rare hymn. Uh, we can see immediately from the first uh, verse. So analysis of the hymn, that is also very good to read. It's like an introduction by Sri Aurobindo. A hymn of the liberation of the divine force. Nature in her ordinary limited and material workings holds the divine force concealed in her secret and subconscious being. This is agony, basically. Only when consciousness enlarges itself towards the one and infinite is it, is it manifested, born for the conscient mind. The clarities of the higher illumination cannot be kept so long as there is not this strength and there as there is not the strength to guard them, 
for hostile powers snatch them away and conceal them again in their secret cavern. Divine will manifested in man, itself liberated, liberates him from the cords which bind him as a victim in the world sacrifice. We attain to it by the teaching of Indra, the divine mind, and it protects the uninterrupted play of the light and destroys the power of falsehood whose imitations cannot hem in its growth and its outflaming. It brings the divine waters from the luminous heaven, the divine wealth liberated from the attacks of the enemy and gives the final peace and perfection. Mm. So here there are few important uh, indications that there are hostile powers which snatch away our illuminations and conceal them again in the secret cavern. So we have that subconscious cave within us, subconscious um, level of consciousness and being, which is below in the dark, which belongs to the whole nature, not only to us. And every time we get the illumination, it is being stolen and, and hidden in the subconscious cave by these powers. Shobindu will speak about these powers later in the, in the secret of the Veda as panis. The panis are the indriyas of action. Whenever we are actively engaged with material life, our hands, feet, procreatory organs, uh, and speech, they're all, when they are engaged, they are creating this blockage for the inner light. They steal the inner light and hide in the subconscious cave. That's why the meth methods of yoga were developed to become totally still, immobile. And only in that way we can focus and find that light and hold on to it. The moment we become active in the body, we lose that connection. And that there lies the biggest problem and difficulty of our human psychology. We can be either active or perceptive. We cannot be both. It's very difficult to keep both. But there are people who've done both. And I think you can be cultivated. Of you course. Can cultivate it by going of back course. and forth between them. Of course. And, and infusing the nature of that silence into the dynamism of nature. Of course. And that's the whole sacrifice. This is the sacrifice. How to make dynamic truth, yeah? how to make through the dynamism of our activities, the presence of the truth that we would be. Yeah? Yes, Eve. The, the, the change from, from uh, uh, from the from the Vedas up to now, where we are, as I understand, in a time where the separation between the the inner and the outer mind is more possible. I never understood why it is so. why we can be in the world today and we can have the separation between these two before we had to go into the cave and hide ourselves from the outer world what happened is it the strength of the inner yeah well the outer has its own um, the panis the uh, the indrias of action which evolved from the darkness these are the instruments of ignorance. Now, whenever they are getting involved, they're, they're sensing the light, they're sensing the illumination, the truth, and the delight of that truth. They are, 
they want it, but they cannot handle it. So what they do, they steal it and they hide it in the subconscious cave where their treasuries are. All the treasures are there hidden. So they are guarding that treasure. They, how to say, they enjoy the very thought that they have the treasure and they trade that treasure for other goods for themselves. They are constantly trading the, the psychological, the higher spiritual treasure without knowing what it really means, without having a, under, how to say, deeper sense of it or knowing the value of it. They do not know the value, but they know that it is valuable. So they are trading it. But there is an evolution. There is an evolution in this sense. Of course. Uh, that's what Sri Aurobindo is doing now also and other great um, rishis who came to bring this bridge, to bridge the inner and outer, to make outer more um, charged with the, with the truth of the inner. And uh, if it is only outer and it fits very well and it ex um, kind of gives us all the privileges and fulfills us enough, then it is not enough for us. We will suffer. We need the correspondence with the inner. It must be there. It must be. And that is the sacrifice. Now, if we act only from the outer point of view for the inner achievement, we will never achieve inwardly the real change. You cannot come to the inner change from the outer uh, change. You can, um, how to say, be, help it. You can, it can be conducive to the inner work, but it cannot change the, the inner being. So the real change comes not from the outer work comes from the inner work only. So if the inner is projected to the outside, the outside, the outer may change dramatically, drastically and become something else. That's where the sacrifice is, um, um, how sacrifice is being maintained. From inner to the outer, not from outer to the inner. Outer is offered to the inner for change. So the inner is invited to come to the outer, as these gods are, and to take their seat around the fire, around the divine will, for the change of the being. And uh, that is how they do it. Mm -hmm. The being is never the same if these gods really come to the physical being that physical being is being changed every time they visit us. And they want, they want this. Of course, they are, they want the Soma. We are the, the holders of Soma, it seems. And within this material manifestation, within the, the quintessence of every feeling and every sense, there is this delight or immortality of um, the being and they want it in this manifestation. It gives a very different sense of being. It is very different from the enjoyment there beyond. Uh, here in this divided world, it has a specific uh, taste or joy. Yeah? which they all want. So they are drawn to it. And then they realize also, the gods, as we read in the Veda, that they also evolve through this engagement in the sacrifice with men, with the Yajamana. This Yajamana is the secret presence in the heart which makes them great. All the gods are growing through it. Hmm. Is it just the recognition then that makes the gods great? It makes them greater by our recognition of them? 
no, I, I, I am not sure. Um, maybe, maybe, but uh, if I, I think it's not even, yeah, recognition in the deeper sense as Yajamana, yes. Uh, no, first of all, they are able to change in the physical world. It's only in the physical frame that they can change. Without physicality, they can't change. They will mm -hmm. stay the same. There is a secret of the physicality for some reason. Yes, if it, it, the Agni is said to be a god as well of will and yeah, and, and he he increases yes. from this connection very very distinct. We know this that he evolves really in our heart. So if the gods also partake in the sacrifice, I find it natural that they should grow from it. If, uh, if Agni grows, or is Agni in a special situation compared to the other gods? Or well, other gods are just different faculties of this divine will. Yeah? The divine will, um, there is a hymn which we will read eventually, where it is said that, uh, Every god is Agni. Eh? Vishnu is Agni, Rudra is Agni. Eh? They are all Agni because what else are they here? You know? So they are, when they are acting upon this manifestation here as a divine will, they are Agni. They join him or they join this will. When they are withdrawn from that activity in their own domain, then they have their own names, as it were. They have their own characteristics. But the moment they engage, they all become vassals, illuminous dwellers within the substance. They do something for, for the nature. They change the nature. They bring the aspect of that luminosity of universal consciousness and power, which this change is uh, effectuated with. Okay, so the divine will manifested in man, itself liberated, liberates him from the cords which bind him as a victim in the world sacrifice. He's, uh, the Veda speaks about three cords, and this is uh, vital, mental, and physical cords. Yeah? Uh, mm -hmm. We attain to it by the teaching of Indra the divine mind, and it protects the uninterrupted play of the light and destroys the powers of falsehood whose imitations cannot ham in its growth and its outflaming. It brings the divine water from the luminous heaven, the divine wealth liberated from the attacks of the enemy, and gives the final peace and perfection. Now here we are in the first line. Kumaram mata yuvatih samubdham guha bibharti nadadati pitre anikam asya naminad janasa puraf pashyanti nitam aratao. The young mother. Mata Yuvatih bears the boy Kumaram Samubdham, pressed down Samubdham in her secret being, and gives him not to the father, Nadadati Pitre. Mm. So she is pregnant with the boy and does not give him to his father. <laughs> But his force is not diminished. The peoples behold him established in front in the upward working of things. Janasah Puraf Pashyanti, they see him in front, Nihitam Arato. Um, who is established within the Arati. Arati is this um, 
constant working of or transforming nature. He is constantly established in every transformation. They see him in front leading the whole march of all the beings, including humanity. Now here there is a quite uh, the youth. I will read. Um, oh, I, should I read Griffith? No, I don't need Griffith. Okay, the points of Sri Aurobindo, the mother and father, are always either nature and the soul, or the material being and the pure mental being. So here can be this interpretation what he gives uh, in the introduction that she doesn't give him yet when the mind is not ready. So she keeps him within her tight and pressing. And then when he is grown up and ready, then she releases him to the mind. Mm. So is that just a, a description of sadhana? Yeah, or the description of when we have this preparatory period, when we are not yet ready to reveal the divine will or spiritual presence in us. It takes long time. Yeah, yeah we are impregnated by the spirit, as it were, and it has to grow within us until it is ready. And then we can give it to the mind. Then the mind, the father, so to say, the heaven, can uh, uh, receive this spiritual perception within us. Then our mind can uh, join the movement of our aspiration. But, uh, or our aspiration within our soul can uh, use the mental capacity. But before that, it's hidden within. It grows slowly. We do not have words. We do not know how to express that thing. <laughs> it's slowly growing into that possibility of that expression. It'd be nice if we could keep our mouth shut until then. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yes. Well, it will not happen anyhow. It will not happen. <laughs> we will talk whether you want it or not. Spiritual gossip. Yeah, and we did talk quite a bit, no? But until it get in, in until he gets established in front, yeah, it's all it's right. all you know, just creating more dosha. Yeah. Yes, we, the, the, the being is not ready to be born and we are always speaking about it as if it is already there. And of course we will be making a lot of doshas. Kam etam tvam yuvate kumaram Kam etam tuvam yuvate kumaram Peshi bibharshi mahishi jajana This is interesting. Purvih hi garbhah sharado vavardha apashyam jatam yadasulta mata. Who is this boy whom thou bearest in thyself when thou art compressed into form, but thy vastness gives him birth? For many seasons the child grew in the womb. I saw him born when the mother brought him forth. Hmm. What child is this thou carriest as handmaid? O youthful one, the consort queen has borne him. The babe unborn increased through many autumns. I saw him born. What time his mother bare him. Apashyam um, jatam. I saw him born. Yad asutamata. When the mother brought him to birth. Come etam. Whom? Who is this Kumara? Who is this prince 
Oh, oh Yuvati, oh young maiden, that you peshi, that you bibharshi, that you carry and press. But when he is born, Jajana, you become Mahishi, you become vast. First you are Yuvati, you bring him, you carry him within, holding, pressing, not allowing him to come. But when he is born, you become great yourself. So it's a very interesting change in nature. Huh? Nature is the mother. She holds him the child, the divine child within herself. And when he is born, she expands. She becomes Mahishi. She becomes the queen. <laughs> Sounds very Christian. <laughs> Well, it uh, sounds very Vedic. The nature is, um, is bringing to birth the divine presence in her. Of course, she will become a queen. She is that Shakti of the you know, Ishvara. She is no more Prakriti of Purusha. She becomes the, his own power. She becomes the queen. By the way, something similar happens to women when they bring to birth children, they change their nature. Even in psychologically, there is a shift of some kind. Hiranyadantam shuchivar namarat kshetrad apashyam ayudham imanam dadano asma amritam viprikvat kimmam anindra. Krinavan Anukta. Beautiful. I saw far off in the field of being one tusked with golden light and pure bright of you who was shaping the weapons of his war. Hiranyadantam, the one who has golden tooth. Shuchivarnam with the <clears throat> Flaming color, Arat from far away, Kshetrat from the far away uh, domain, field from the beyond, Apashyam, I saw, Ayudhami Manam, who is uh, shaping uh, his weapon, Ayudha. Dadano asma amritam viprikvat. I give him to the immortality in me, in all my separate parts. And what shall they do to me who have not the word and the God mind is not in them? Anindra, those who have no Indra. Anukta, those who do not have the word, what can they do to me now? Hmm. I give to him the immortality in me. Tadano asma amritam viprikvat, in all separate parts. Shubindu has uh, several notes, footnotes here, uh, for the separate parts, soma, the wine of immortality is given to the gods in three parts, on three levels of our being, mind, life, and body. So on all the levels, the soma, the ambrosia, the enjoyment of our existence has to be given to the higher consciousness in us. And 16, number 16 about the word that what they can do to us, those who do not have word, the expressive word which manifests that which is hidden, brings out into expression that which is unexpressed. This is the major actually characteristic of the word, to bring and to manifest that which is hidden. So what can they do to the person who has this power to express what is hidden? And what could they do to the one who has the 
who do, do not have this power of the mind, of Indra, of the divine mind. It's what is interesting in these hymns that uh, it is always first person. I saw Apashyam. Yeah? Arat Kshetrat from far away realm. Hiranyadantam with, with golden teeth. Shuchivarnam with flaming color. Ayudhamimanam creating weapons. And I give to him the Dano Asmai. Amritam, the immortality I give to him, be prikvat in all my parts of being. Kimba Manindra Krinavan, what these creatures who do not have the divine mind can do to me, those who do not have the divine word. So creatures without the divine mind and word, what can they do to me now? Nothing they can do. I already manifested him in my nature. So those darker forces who cannot speak the word, who cannot think the thought, they cannot do anything to me. So it's a kind of invincibility. Mm. I was thinking this is like as the, those that are enlightened when they separate themselves from the outer thoughts, they are free, they live without the thoughts burdening them. It's more like this. Mm. Yeah, also thoughts, feelings. And even if there are physical troubles coming, they will take them in totally different light as, as, a, as an indication what is to be done. And they will be engaged with a very peaceful and very concentrated consciousness and will be free from everything. They cannot do anything to them, these forces. This liberation, if Indra comes with, the, the, with this mind which we need, if we don't have it, we are still in the duality. We are waiting for Indra, we are calling for Indra, or Agni is calling for Indra. Yeah, mm. definitely. And there is, uh, they have to unite, and that is the purpose of the sacrifice. The agni, the aspiration, the call, and Indra is the answer, because this is the transcendental mind which descends, brings the light of the sun, and the light of the sun and the, the flame of uh, agni, of, of fire, they come together into one energy field. And that's the, the purpose of the sacrifice. Yeah. Then there is no more um, place for these darker forces to interfere because from above and from below, you are um, charged with the presence of divine consciousness and force. What are these shaping, who, the shaping the weapons of, of his war? Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> about the weapons, they speak all the time. And uh, Agni brings uh, the, all kinds of weapons. And the Maruts have spears and arrows and missiles. Indra. And Indra has uh, Vajra and other missiles, discus, uh, discus yes. So um, these are the the tools. What do you even need them for if you have um, kind of that invincibility that, that, that the dark forces can't do anything to you? That's why he has that, because that's how the dark forces cannot do anything. But you have to have weapons. You will have to pierce. You have to cleave. You, know, you have to cut in 
into the darkness. How else would you do it? And that activity is described as weapon. Mm, yeah. the cl cutting into the darkness, cleaving the darkness, yeah. breaking it into the parts is the, the power of his weapons. Um, there's nothing wrong. It's just the symbol of the do of the action of the change of the, the darkness by light or devouring, for example. These rishis are called Atri rishis from Atri family, and that means the devourer. Atri is from root Ad to the eater. They devour the darkness. They, uh, they, as in the in Savitri Shubhendra describes that the god of death was devoured by the light. The light has eaten it up. So it was digested, it was changed, it was pervaded by light. So this is the weapon. The teeth. Why he should have golden yeah. teeth? Hmm? To bite. <laughs> to bite, to crush something very hard, which cannot be crushed otherwise. It will not be given so easily, freely. It needs some working, you know, some work on it. It has to crush it, to chew it, to digest it. Mm -hmm. If you look at our nature, physical nature, you will see the same symbolism in nature. What is the eating actually? and consuming others. We consume the energies of others and make our own, we appropriate, make our own bodies from the bodies of others. It's a constant ongoing process of transformation of the form. Why? Because the consciousness has to grow and it is looking for a new form, more suitable form in nature. So the nature, the forms of nature have to be crushed, consumed, changed constantly. I always thought that this eating others is not really a very good arrangement. Yeah? Why should we eat others and they eat us? We are afraid to be eaten by others and they are afraid of us. We are all the time afraid to be consumed, to be crushed, to be killed, to be transformed, to be appropriated by some other force. We are constantly in this fear of not it letting... Is, yeah? yeah. It is said in... Subinda said that uh, the first... I think it's in his uh, essays on the Gita, he says that the first you have to overcome, or you have to look the existence straight in the face. You have to accept the death and the life as it is. I think this is something about what you talk now. Right, and it is not an easy thing. Even if we think we did, we will see that we didn't. Many times in our feelings, in our mind, in our dreams, we don't. We run away, we are scared. We want to avoid any, any collision, any change, any consumption, because we will be consumed by some other force. We, are, we don't want to be consumed. We want to survive. And this idea of survival is now dominant, predominant idea in the world, as if it is a new religion, survival, you know, sustainability. You cannot sustain, you cannot survive. There is no way. You have to accept the world as constantly changing and yourself is constantly losing and gaining something and all the time on the move. You cannot sit. You have to move and accept it. I was thinking, we, we were, uh, with regards to what Sid just said, that one of the things uh, in the previous um, verse, uh, it, it seemed like this kind of um, 
this transformation requires a, a, a certain kind of honest self examination. I mean, it, you have to be able to look at yourself and be honest with yourself and almost nobody is. I mean, it's, it's very hard to look at yourself and see all the darkness and the ugliness that you still embody while you are um, is seeking and, and searching for the divine. You know, there's a, all kinds of things that, you know, a, a, a spiritual arrogance and all kinds of other things that are kind of filthy <laughs> mm-hmm. and, and ugly that we, mm-hmm. that we accept about ourselves on that, in that, in that process of surrender mm. along the route. Mm. Yeah. I mean, this, we- this whole weapon thing um, and all these dark forces and all this darkness, I mean, we have to, I mean, accept that we are also those things. Of course, they're not yeah. outside of us. They're they're absolutely part of our our own character. And still, um, it is not totally who we are. Yeah, it is something which we took on on ourselves to work with. Um, the Sri Aurobindo says there is only one sin we have. And this is quite interesting. It may explain that we don't need to also think about ourselves as sinners. There is only one sin, and that is selfishness. There is no other selfishness. When we try to maintain and to support and to sustain something which has to change, and this is the only sin we have. We are holding on to something which has no place anymore. I was thinking thinking that Go ahead, Sid. Mother said, cling to the truth. This doesn't mean that you only cling to the good um, or definition of what truth means. But because if you cling to the truth and you still uh, experience these feelings and thoughts, then you are doing the work. Mm-hmm. I was thinking, it's something here between this cling to the truth and offering yourself, mm-hmm. offering what you have problem with, offering what your feelings you can't, which you have problem with, and so on. Yeah. Yeah, Mother even says that uh, uh, we uh, must accept the truth, whatever it may be. It may be something you don't want, you don't like, you you really want to run away from that. But if you are not ready to accept it, then you are not ready to face the truth about yourself and the world. And it is not only you, because the whole thing comes through you and it is the whole world is flowing into you with all the things you have to face. It's not you who is separate from the world and you have to perfect this and the world, whatever it may be, it doesn't work that way. The moment you perfect something in yourself, there will be more problems coming from the world from within you. You will face them all the time. So this is a constant sacrifice. And we are blaming ourselves sometimes that we are not perfect. We don't need even to do this. Only one thing we have to take care of is this. We should be able to face the truth and to follow it, whatever it may be. Uh, uh, as, as you know, as Jesus said, when you remember when he was asked by them, by the priest 
on they say that you are Messiah. Why did you come? You remember? He said, yes, I am Messiah. I came to face the truth to the end. This was the answer. To face mm. the truth to the end. And can you imagine where it led him? It led him to the cross to be crucified, to be, to be killed. Yeah. And that is, he had to face. Yeah. Uh, of course we are not ready. We are shrinking from the very idea of facing the truth to the end. Who wants mm. this? Who wants to be crucified? Well, everybody's dying. Every, I mean... Eventually. Every, yeah. Everybody. Always. Is right. being, you know, the sacri that sacrifice is, it, is kind of woven into the very structure of being alive on earth every being faces that sacrifice yeah whether we want it or not yeah <laughs> we can well, run away from it but uh, it will catch us up somewhere yeah everybody thinks it's not going to happen to them <laughs> and it is happening all the time so is it not better to really be on the side of the truth it's easy, you know? Well, that's what Mother said, right? That's what yeah. she said. Just cling to the truth. Right. And it makes you very unpopular for the most part. Oh, <laughs> yeah, but who cares? Popularity is, is exactly the path of survival and that thing which creates an illusion of being. Okay, we can stop here. Very nice, very good uh, thoughts today. So you didn't give all of us permission to record. I um, did. No. I, no. I, I have this uh, recording, um, so I can send to you. Yes, please. This was a very, um, uh, particularly the part about the uh, Rishis. I would like to hear that again, if you wouldn't mind. Of course. Oh, yes. And please send it to me, too. I was recording, but I um, got summarily dumped off the um, internet on my home account, and I'm now on my phone. Okay. So I missed oh. the second half of the okay. recording. No problem. I will, I will send it. Oh, okay. Yes. I have people, somebody just drove up, so we need to do mantra, and I need to go. Oh, wow. Manasi Pratishtheta, Manome Vachi Pratishthetam, Avira Virma Edhi, Vedas Yama Ani Staha, Shrutam Mema Prahasihi, Anena Dhitena, Oratran Sandadhami, Ritam Vadishyami, Satyam Vadishyami Tanma Mavatu Tadvaktara Mavatu Avatu Mam Avatu Vaktaram Avatu Vaktaram Om Shanti 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 Hari Om Okay. Great.